Hello, everyone. It's great to see so many familiar faces here tonight, and especially wonderful to see so many new ones as well. I'm Laura Gonziorek, the Senior Associate Director of the Dinicola Center for Ethics and Culture, and on behalf of Center Director Carter Sneed, who's sadly not able to make it tonight, thank you so much for joining us this evening at our annual Bread of Life dinner. For those of you who are joining us for the first time at this event, the Bread of Life dinner occurs once a year and is meant to provide the space for you, our students, and wonderful Soren Fellows. The opportunity to listen to a leader in our campus community, reflect on ways in which a culture of life has affected his or her life, and to share in a meal and conversation with members of the Notre Dame community. We are so delighted tonight to be joined by Dean Santiago Schnell, the Dean of the College of Science, who will offer this evening's reflection. A few housekeeping points about the event before we get underway. In a few moments, I'll invite our center chaplain, Father Terry Ehrman, to offer our opening prayer before our meal. Then, feel free to get started on your salads and introduce yourself to your table. After about 15 minutes, Soren Fellow Peter Nagy will introduce Dean Santiago Schnell, who will speak for about 15 minutes or so. I won't hold you to that. <laughs> Entrees will be served after Dean Schnell finishes his reflection, and we hope you'll use his remarks as a springboard to share in conversation with your table about any part of his talk or your experience in considering what it looks like to build a culture of life here on campus and beyond. Most tables are joined by a faculty or staff member from Notre Dame who can offer thoughts on his or her experience on those same themes. After dinner, Soren Fellow and Bread of Life co-chair Lauren Douglas will open this open the discussion up to the floor for some questions and answers over coffee and dessert. With that said, I'd like to invite to the podium Father Terry Ehrman. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Almighty and ever-living God, we praise and glorify you for your goodness. We thank you for this day for our labors, for our studies, for our joys and struggles as we come to know you better. Send your spirit among us tonight to transform us in your love that emptied itself upon the cross for us. Bless our time here together. Bless this food. Bless all those who prepared it, that this food might nourish us and help us to do your will. We ask all this through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good evening, everyone. My name is Pete Nagy, and I am one of the co-chairs of this evening's Bread of Life dinner. We are delighted to have each of you with us here tonight. On behalf of the members of the Soren Fellows Program at the DeNicola Center for Ethics and Culture, and all of our guests, I'd like to thank the DCEC staff and our faculty representatives here this evening for providing this opportunity to share a meal together and consider our roles and responsibilities in building a culture of life. I'm now delighted to introduce our speaker. Santiago Schnell was appointed the William K. Warren Foundation Dean of the College of Science at the University of Notre Dame by University President Reverend John Jenkins in September 2021. He also holds appointments as professor in the Department of Biological Science and in the Department of Applied and Computational Mathematics and Statistics. As Dean of the College of Science, Dr. Schnell guides the college to fulfill its mission to prepare the scientific leaders of tomorrow and its commitment to fostering advancements that answer the world's toughest questions and solve its most enduring problems. Dr. Schnell earned his bachelor's degree in biology from Venezuela before completing his doctoral studies in mathematical biology at the University of Oxford in 2002. Subsequently, he secured two prestigious research fellowships at the same institution before taking an assistant professorship at Indiana University in 2004. Santiago was appointed associate professor in the Department of Molecular and Integrative Physiology of the University of Michigan Medical School in 2008. He was promoted to full professor in 2015 followed by his appointment as Department Chair of Molecular and Integrative Physiology, a role he held from 2017 to 2021. Schnell's research program departs from the premise that there is a continuum between health and disease. 
If we are capable of measuring this continuum, we will be in, a, in the position of detecting disease earlier and understanding it better to intervene more precisely. He is internationally renowned for his pioneering research, which has significantly advanced our quantitative understanding of enzyme-catalyzed reactions. His most notable achievement is the formulation of the Schnell-Mendoza equation, a streamlined method for determining the physical constants of enzymes in both basic science and clinical laboratories. Furthermore, he has made significant contributions to the foundational enzymological quantitative model of the polymerase chain reaction, an indispensable technique in the fields of life sciences, medical diagnostics, and forensic science. Throughout his career, he has garnered numerous accolades for his research and teaching endeavors. These include the Arthur Winfrey Prize, the SACNAS Distinguished Scientist Award, and the Emerging Leader in Health and Medicine Award bestowed by the U.S. National Academy of Medicine. His distinguished status is underscored by his membership of the American Academy of Sciences and Letters, and as a fellow of the Society for Mathematical Biology, the Royal Society of Biology, the Royal Society of Chemistry, the Royal Society of Medicine, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science. The title of Dean Schnell's reflection tonight is Embracing Life, a journey through life-limiting diseases and the call to protect life. Friends, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dean Santiago Schnell. Well, thank you for the generous introduction. Let me see if I find my remarks. Uh, because if I don't read them, then this talk might go for hours. Uh, well, well let, let me tell you that you know, I'm very grateful for the invitation first. And I understand that we have a record-breaking number of attendees uh, in the audience tonight. I sincerely hope that my remarks will meet your expectations and enrich your evening experience. If for any reason my remarks fall short, rest assured that the University of Notre Dame is renowned for its dinners. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but well, I want to express my gratitude for Phil Tran, so the program coordinator of student formation and cultural, uh, culture of life initiatives at the Nicola Center. And I also want to thank uh, Lauren Douglas, um, Peter Nagy, for the invaluable contributions to this event. Uh, and let me tell you, so for me, it's a huge honor to be here at Notre Dame. So I'm holding this William K. Uh, Warren Foundation Dean of the College of Science. Uh, beyond my usual duties, so I'm an active scientist. Uh, and I, I focus my research effort primarily on the study of rare diseases and patient advocacy at Notre Dame. And this is one of the reasons I decided to come to Notre Dame. The study of rare diseases is very well known in the university. It established the first ever center dedicated to the study of rare diseases many years ago. And, and the dean, so it's not only my job, but you know, as well, it's, deep, it's profoundly uh, uh, personal. So I'm, you're going to know now why. And if I break into tears, you have to apologize me, but the story is very personal. So in 1998, my sister received the news that she was expecting her fifth child. The journey ahead was filled of anxiety. She has experienced the loss of three babies through a stillbirth or within 24 hours after birth. And from all those five pregnancies, only one baby survived. And you know, to this point, she's a 26-year-old physician. And you know, my mother, so she was heartbroken with the news. And let me tell you why. So my mother as well experienced the loss of three uh, infants in a similar manner. So either they will still birth or within the 24 hours of being born. And you know, given such devastating history, the pregnancy of my sister came with a source deep of concern for both my sister and our mother. Surprisingly, after nine months, my sister gave birth to a precious baby boy. However, so my sister discovered that my nephew had had that syndrome a few hours after the delivery. So this is an extremely rare disease. And let me tell you how rare it is. The prevalence of births is around one in three million. The chance of surviving is one in 10. So when you see somebody with Hadan syndrome, there's only one in 10 million in the nation or around the world. 
And it's extremely rare because the following thing happens when you suffer from Hadan syndrome. So critical organs, like the lungs, the heart, and the gastrointestinal system, shuts down when you go to sleep. Literally, you go to sleep and it's, you are dead. It may sound unusual, but for a moment, so there was some great relief in my family. For the first time, there was a possible explanation for the tragic loss of six babies between my sister and our mother. However, we soon came to realize the gravity of the situation. The doctors informed my sister that her son, uh, intense medical needs would prevent him from leaving the hospital. He would require frequent connection to a ventilator, multiple surgeries, and a complex medical care. The physicians asked my sister if she wanted to disconnect the baby from the ventilator. My sister called me for advice, but also to see if there was a medical solution. At the time, I was about to start my independent research career at the University of Oxford. My sister was hopeful that if there was any chance for a treatment or a cure, it would be surely in one of the best universities of the world. So with profound sadness, I have to deliver the harsh reality to her. Hadad syndrome is considered an orphan disease, a condition largely overlooked by research institutes and pharmaceutical companies. Upon hearing this news, my sister broke into tears. She said, my child is no orphan. He has not lost both parents. He has not been abandoned by his parents, nor they are unable to care for him. Towards the end of the phone call, she made me promise that I would use my talents as a scientist to study rare disease. And to this day, I have lived up to that promise. During my research career, I, along with many dear colleagues that I have, I have studied 10 different rare diseases, from rare forms of cancers and diabetes to more recently, which is the current work we're doing here at Notre Dame, studying rare variants of epilepsy. I have been very passionate about these projects and the findings that have been published among some of the best scientific journals that, that, that are known to, to biomedical scientists. You know what I did after my sister phone call. Now you might be wondering what my sister did after the call. She did not follow the physician's advice. She did not disconnect the child from the ventilator. My sister, brave and stoic, and you know, she has always been brave and stoic since she was a child, accepted the, the news of a baby boy as a blessing. And to be very honest with you, so we're very devout Catholics. Every single family member agreed with the decision. But I have to be very honest with you. We felt shocked, scared, and completely morally inadequate. And why? So we, we started to make these questions. How bad would this boy disability would be? How would his sister and then my children, so that are his cousins would cope? How my sister and brother-in-law would cope with it? Would their marriage survive taking care of this child? How would be the rest of our lives as a family would be spent together looking at, after this child? Surprisingly, so, and to very much of the great news and the hard work of my sister, my nephew was able to leave the hospital. My sister ref retrofitted her son, Rune, into an intensive care unit. We spent a lot of time worrying. We spent a lot of time together. He was intelligent and lively. He proved to be more brave and stoic than my sister ever was. And let me tell you, our lives with my nephew were a blessing and a, a pure joy. Unfortunately, he passed away at the age of 10. Upon reflecting of my experiences, you know, I always wonder why physicians and scientists often quickly endorse the concept of assistant death. Why they would disconnect a baby from a ventilator without giving him a chance. In Canada and Europe, and in some parts of the United States, euthanasia is not only legal for patients facing incurable diseases, like my nephew had that syndrome, but they are also giving euthanasia to patients that have debilitating mental health conditions. And let's consider another case of a young person. So this is the case of Chanti Dacord, a young woman 
who at the age of 17, she was the victim of the 2016 Brussels airport attack, and she witnessed the death of several of her classmates. Last year, at the age of 23, she chose euthanasia. A team of doctors and psychiatrists determined that her, PS, her PTSD and depression were incurable. And let me tell you, and I have to be very honest, so I do disagree with the assessment of the physician because a 23-year-old who feels that she has lived enough is not a person who actually deserves to die. It's a person that requires our help, the help of those physicians. However, for various reasons, the medical and scientific establishment and the community seem to have resigned. The Cortez case illuminates the existing shortcomings in the availability of treatments for PTSD and similar psychological trauma. Our understanding of neuroscience, the needs to address the rudimentary challenge that cause of witnessing a traumatic event there is still room in the inventory. We have no idea what happens on the brain and how it's transformed after those changes. It's likely that the pain of somebody who suffers from PSTT or depression can never be completely eliminated. But let me tell you, there are potential therapies, including certain drugs that maybe of them they, they remain I I illegal, could potentially mitigate the symptoms. Yet for a myriad of reasons, Research concerning life-limiting illnesses, such that they had that syndrome that my nephew suffered from, or depression that haunted the court dead, they're still in early stages. In our advanced liberal society, we struggle to find solutions for many life-limiting diseases, yet in Oricle, some members of our society have developed an answer. They have become more proficient at facilitating the dead of people who suffer from light-limited uh, diseases that discover in treatments at them. And why may I ask, why is this the case? There are countless reasons. Treating a life-limited patient is not only financially taxing, and let me tell you, my family went into ruins, into making a, a run of a boy into an intensive care unit. But it's also time-intensive, requiring the provision of comprehensive care and attention. Furthermore, the process is emotionally exhausting. So you know, still when I think about my nephew, I cry. I'm hurt from the whole situation and I'm going to be hurt in perpetuity. And it's not only traumatic for the families, but imagine my sister and my brother-in-law and, and the sister of my nephew, but as well the patient itself, the caregivers and the physicians that treat these patients. But you know, there is something that we learned. My family, in getting my nephew, we discovered at first hand that even though there are considerable financial issues, logistic and emotional challenges, there is something that we were able to unearth from this experience. All the misfortunes are only the bitter part of our lives. There are two sides of the coins in life. So that bitter part of the life. But the other part illuminates the courageous and heroic aspects of life and highlights the nobility of the human spirit when tasked to protect human life. And you know, this is why my sister did very bravely. Embracing life, regardless of the challenges, allow you to experience only one thing, is the richness of love. This love signifies the essence of Fahrenheit, like my sister did, the notion of family and friendship, like my family and my brother and his family, they did, and all the friends of our family who were incredibly supportive through this situation. But also illuminate something which is really amazing, is the experience of perseverating and living life at the fullest when you have a light limiting disease, which is my nephew. But it also has something more in common, which is this common goal that uniting scientists and doctors, those that we believe that we need to fight for those who believe that they're lost causes, and advocate for patients to try to find treatments and cures for extreme conditions like depression, PSST, or rare diseases. Regrettably, ad eutanasia advocates they tend to overlook these heroic aspects of human life. They seem to believe that the secret of a happy life 
is to die before happiness is lost. The reality is that happiness and suffering in life, they're intertwined. You don't have a happy life and then a sad life, or you have a sad life or happy life. They are all intertwined together and you leave them as you move along. They also seem unwilling to acknowledge a universal truth. Life doesn't grant us everything that we desire. We must learn to appreciate not only the things that have been given to us, but we need to find peace with the things that they haven't given to us. Euthanasia supporters tend to overlook something else. Biomedical research and modern medicine has prolonged the lifespan beyond anything that would have been anticipated a century ago. We live in a world that previous generations could only have dreamed of. While our world is facing many unresolved challenges, we have to be grateful for the opportunities that these problems and challenges present to us. New scientific and biomedical challenges, in fact, are the catalysis that ignite the human spirit and awaken our aspirations, which is something that we're doing here at Notre Dame. We must cultivate a society where every individual, particularly our youth, believes that in reward of hard work and the value of perseverance, they're important. We must acknowledge everyone, including ourselves, to strive for better, for more, to improve, and to protect human life through scientific and technological research, our scholarly work in this university, and the advoc advocacy that we can do outside it. I always have in my thoughts and in my prayers my nephew. And I, as I reflect on, on my nephew, and you know, I do this on a regular basis, so, and his siblings, and in fact, my siblings that I never got know to know, a line from Pope Benedict XVI from his inaugural mass always resonates deeply on me. He said in, in that mass, we are not some casual and meaningless product of evolution. Each of us is a result of a thought of God. Each of us is will, each of us is love, and each of us is necessary. And I have to tell you, I find always solace and comfort in these words. Each of one of those is will, each one of those is love, and each of one of us is necessary. And let me tell you why I find solace on those words. I believe that God has created each one of us with a unique purpose. So I wouldn't be here, and I wouldn't be studying rare diseases without my nephew. We must turn all our circumstances and events of our life in occasions to sanctify our daily work and fulfill our Christian ordinary duties. We all have a mission. Some of us might not know it on this point. But in some form, we're an integral par part of that divine pl plan that God has given to us through our mission. We form a link in a change, bringing connections between people. Life challenges can be daunting, but losing sight of the heroic potential within us could be our greatest loss. We are born to unravel the world's mysteries through our research and societal contributions. You know, I'm the great believer that we are here to reveal the mysteries that God has put in creation. And we are called to do good and fulfill God's creative work. You know, as I conclude, you know, I ask you, what is your God-given mission? Probably you haven't discovered it on this point. And you know, the easiest way to find that, what drives you to rise every morning? I urge you to utilize your time constructively so we only live once and lives can be very, very short. Let's aspire to uncover with the scholarly work that you are going to be doing here at Notre Dame. And if you become academics studying different problems, the secrets of creation, the fundamental principles of life, so that we can develop innovative approaches to diagnose, treat, and prevent orphan or life-limiting diseases. And as well, we can do work by advocacy through law, economics, political sciences, that would help to reveal the mysteries of creation. Let's try to create a world that our successor will look with pride. Thank you.
Thank you, Dean Schnell, for such rich and moving reflection. Entrees will now be served, and a question and answer period will follow during dessert. Please remind the wait staff if you have particular dietary needs. Thank you so much, and please enjoy the company and conversation. Hello, everyone. My name is Lauren Douglas, and I am one of this year's student co-chairs of the Bread of Life Dinner. We're just about ready to begin our question and answer period. I'll invite Dean Schnell to come up to the podium in a moment to answer any questions from the floor. In the meantime, please enjoy your coffee and desserts. A few quick notes before we get started. We have wireless microphones to ensure everyone can hear your question. Please raise your hand if you have a question and the microphone will be walked over to you. Please introduce yourself, your year, and your major or program before you ask your question. We'll wrap up around 7.50. It might be a little bit longer than that. 7.55. <laughs> At which time I'll share a few announcements before inviting Laura back up to close out the evening. With that, it's my pleasure to welcome Dean Schnell back up to the podium. Well, any questions? Bring it on, come on. Looking for the questions. It was so terrible, my talk, so. <laughs> Hello, thank you for your talk, Dean Schnell. Um, I have a brief question about, well, yes, uh, Lucas. My name is Lucas, hello, Shadirang Yanis. I'm an architecture fifth year. And, well, I, you know, a lot of your talk focused on problems in the beginning of life and euthanasia of the young. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about euthanasia and end of life issues with the elderly, especially now as we have kind of a crisis of the family and lack of, you know, kids kind of a lot of old people are in old homes, they're feeling abandoned, they're dying yeah. alone, mm -hmm. right? They're children, or they might not even have children, right? They don't have any real community. I was wondering if you have any kind of, anything to address regarding that, I don't yes. know. No, it's, it's an excellent question, so, and it's a good point to raise because, you know, one of the things that I find uh, with the, uh, the people who advocate for the euthanasia for the old, is that they see the same, the same problem that the advocates observe, that you have a good life and suddenly the life doesn't become good. And it's just better to actually end it quicker. And you know, I was reading, I'm a fan of Roger Scruton, and recently I was reading actually a lecture that he gave where he was advocating for the death of, in those cases, uh, and even for people who suffer from dementia. And let me tell you one thing. So, uh, I fundamentally disagree because we still know very little about what happens as you get older and you deteriorate. There are many things that cause joy, and, and for example, with people who have dementia, that they haven't realized that. And I have a perfect example. So my dad actually started to suffer from early onset Alzheimer when he was 62, 65. And you know, he ended up passing away at the age of 86. It would have been perfectly normal, so he was a scholar. He, he was a Supreme Court Justice in Venezuela, a senior Supreme Court Justice at the time. Uh, you know, very accomplished lawyer. He studied classics. He had a degree on, or a PhD on canon law. A brilliant individual, so it was always a pleasure to talk to him and see him deteriorating and becoming somebody who was a shadow of what he was, was incredibly painful. And you could have thought, well, maybe it's a good idea just to advocate for the end of life because it's a problem for us. He is not anymore himself. Well, months before he passed away, so he came and visited our home. And he was with a, a, a cube block. So my mother was talking to my wife and I, complaining about my dad, saying how pain in the neck is actually taking care for somebody who has complete dementia. At the time, my dad couldn't recognize any of his siblings, so any of, of his children or grandchildren could only recognize my mother. But, and while my mother was complaining, he would write something, hand it to her. She would write something, hand it to her. And suddenly my mother said, look, look, this is what I'm telling you about. He's just writing gibberish. And you're going to grab the piece of paper. And I said, mom, this is not gibberish. 
So I think this is Cicero. Because when I could read in Latin, the structure of the sentence, and Cicero has a unique way to actually write in Latin. So I went very quickly, so I Googled. And what actually he did, he was writing the first few lines of the, of the Catherine's, the, the Catherine dialogues. So if people know what the Catherine's are, so Catherine is a woman that actually went to the Senate to complain to the, to the senators in Rome. And the first line is actually the senators telling, you a stupid woman who doesn't know what you're talking about. <laughs> you know, he wrote that with complete dementia, unable to understand, <laughs> unable to recognize his children, unable to recognize his brothers and sisters, unable to recognize even the place where he was. But something in the brain was working sufficiently to remember the classics that he studied as an undergrad and complained to his wife <laughs> that she was a pain in the neck. So, uh, you know, that's why, you know, I, I'm always an advocate that, you know, before ending life, so what, what is presenting is challenges. So we, we think that people who suffer from dementia, they're completely disconnected from us. And as a matter of fact, as a daily reminder, so I took that piece of the cube, it was hidden for, I don't know, 10 years in a book, and I recently found it in the book, and now I have it in, in my library. So I have the piece of paper with the translation. And not only that, so we, he signed it, Echo Ome, I'm a man. So at the end, so to, to explain to my mother in whatever language he, he could express, that he was still a man. So, you know, for, for me it's a really impressive thing. And you know, we scientists tend to terminate life even before we know what's going on. And we believe that there is suffering, we believe that the people are not with us. But there are so many surprises. So that, that would be the advocate, the, the advocate. Well, you know, as well, we have the problem in Canada, in the United States, and in Europe, that children abandon their parents. And, and you know, that, I don't have a quick solution for that other than you know, those who are still able to love, they should go and take care of those individuals who are abandoned by society. Hello, I'm Julia Wilson, a sophomore studying neuroscience and mathematics with a minor in theology. So you mentioned that you're currently working on cases in rare forms of epilepsy. I was wondering if you could speak more to that. I'm curious. Oh, yes. Yeah. So, so the, this is part of a national project. So there is a, a center grant that is a center grant of research without walls. So we have scientists dispersed all across the United States. There, there are a series of, of genetic modifications on on the, on the channel. So every neuron has channels that they open and close to allow the nerve impulse to be transmitted. And what happens is that you have uh, mutations on those channels that doesn't allow them to open effectively and then it, they trigger ep epilepsy. So my section of the project is with a team in Northwestern and in NYU. What we're trying to do is actually take the sequence of those mutations and figure out if we can come with predictions of whether they would trigger an early a rare epilepsy or they, or they won't. So we're doing an AI model where if somebody gets sequenced and they believe that has one of these rare epilepsies, we can identify it more quickly and, 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 and identify the type and how it could be used. But you know, I just pay a, pay a small role on that project. So the people from Northwestern and NYU are the ones who are having the heavy lifting. We got a few. Hi, um, I'm Josie, I'm a nursing major. Um, I just have a question on how do you suggest for healthcare professionals to advocate for those who maybe want to do euthanasia, and maybe trying to convince them otherwise or to choose life? Well, you know, I have the radical approach. Uh, and, and you know, it's the same approach that I use when people now, they don't want to read the classics like Shakespeare or the Iliad. And you know, I, I don't think people, people are becoming less lazy. It's more easy to read a contemporary piece of work than reading a classic. The classics are classic because you know, they are difficult to read, but at the same time, they provide universal values. I think the people who are advocating for euthanasia, they are actually going the easy way. It's too hard to take for care of these individuals. It's too hard to do research in this area. It's a research that maybe is not going to reward me. Uh, uh, and the way to go about it, you can treat them harshly, harshly and telling them you're being lazy, you don't want to do the work. 
But at the same time, you can advocate in the way that I, I try to explain to you. I think the fundamental mistake that I hear from everyone who believes in euthanasia, even the physicians that, you know, they were family friends that advocated for my sister to disconnect the child, is that in the moment they see the disease like no doses, they can never see anything else positive. But the reality, all of us that we live with my nephew, there were so many positive experiences beyond of what we could believe. And you know, all these questions that I have, how my sister and my brother-in-law could, could be able to cope. So how my, my children would be able to interact with his child. You know, all those doubts that we have were completely dis dis dissipated in the moment, you know, we realized that he's another human being, that he's, he's perfectly normal in his own way. Uh, and he's able to interact with us, we're able to provide him love, he's able to provide lo love to us. And I think it's something that is very difficult for people for un to understand that have never lived in one of those cases. In my experience, most of the people who advocate for euthanasia, they have never been close to a patient that is about to die and they can have this conversation with the patient and understand that there is love and goodness and there is a lot of joy with those interactions, even within pain, is joy. And, and you know, if they are Catholics, and I have this uh, an argument from one of my philosophy professors, so I have a minor in philosophy when I did my undergraduates, he would always have this argument, which I find really fascinating. Imagine Jesus in the cross, so suffering this pain, and then somebody, he, he says to so, somebody, tells him, give him a Prozac or a Valium so that he feels much better. From the theological point of view, that suffering, that human experience of suffering, was very transformative for humanity. And we tend to have this notion that suffering is something that is not part of the human condition. It's very much part of the human condition. And it's, it's redeeming, which is what happened with Jesus in the cross. So in the, if somebody would have given him a value, no, none of us would have been saved. So that's a, a fundamental problem as well. People do not realize very easily that you cannot dissociate pain because pain is part of the human experience and not allowing somebody to experience it, e even how painful it is. And you know, I suffer from a number of underlying conditions. I have regular pain and I suffer a lot, but you know, not having that doesn't let you to appreciate as well the other precious aspects of life. Hi, my name's Cameron and I'm a senior studying business analytics and economics. My question was about the physician who gave the advice towards your family when your nephew was born. Um, what advice would you have given a family in that same situation? Because I feel like that, that's a very difficult position, position to be in as the physician, especially knowing the suffering and not knowing perhaps the circumstances of each family's ability to care for such a child. Well, during the case of, of our family, they, if we wouldn't have the financial means to make the investment, the child could have lived in the hospital. There are many of these children who have the extreme uh, sy syndrome. Actually, they can live and have a very effective and successful life in the hospital for many years until a, a foundation or a group of people can actually help them then to leave the hospital. But, but, but again, the, the advice is, 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 is this issue that, you know, if you decide, imagine that all physicians and scientists for a given moment that decide we are going to give up for all individuals who have a life-limiting disease. So the secret of life, uh, and you know, this is a way why I study rare diseases, it's a very cold-blooded justification that my sister might think that I'm absolutely crazy uh, and, uh, and would probably hate me for this. And you know, sometimes when I'm talking to donors about why we study rare diseases, most of the rare diseases tend to be fatal. And, and the reason they're really exciting scientifically, and this is my, my scientific hat, if I want to discover the secrets of health, I need to understand that how I can break it. So if I want to have individuals who can live a longer and a healthier life, I need to figure out what they kill them. By killing all the patients that can provide you that mysterious answer, actually we are turning back the advances that we're going to be making in medicine. We learn because we have that aspiration to discover that treatment. And in the moment we discover that treatment, not only we're restoring somebody to the healthy state of keeping them in maintenance, 
but we're learning something of what makes an individual a healthy human being. The goal of medicine, many people have this misconception that the goal of medicine is studying disease. No, the goal of medicine is studying health. It's making sure that people can have a very healthy lifestyle. And we use diseases for actually studying that. By giving up for the most difficult cases, you are giving up in the very central mission of, of, of medicine, which is how we can make society healthier. Thank you so much, Dean Chanel. My name is Elliot Kerwin. I'm a sophomore studying physics. And I'm joined here with my peers in this room. And I'm very curious if you have any advice for us as we take our gifts and talents out into the world. Yeah. And to, for me, you're, as a science student, you're very inspiring with your work and how you've, mm -hmm. in some sense, um, I think we're called to live out lives of holiness through our work mm -hmm. as professionals and, and in academia. And so I was curious if you had advice for us on the best way that we can seek sainthood through mm -hmm. our day-to-day -day research and, and efforts. Well, you know, I always use the example I love, the ex you know, and I think we're getting closer to the same time. So the first Christians. So I always think that the first Christians are very special. So we didn't have priests. In fact, we were in prosecution all the time. And if you come out as a Catholic, you end up in the circles with the lions just to be meat for, for them. Uh, and you know, when, so if, if you're a Catholic, a very old Catholic, you, you have this mission of becoming apostolic. But I always say that, you know, becoming apostolic is not like, like going to your first date and saying, would you marry me? You're going to scare to death the person that you're going to be asking for marriage there. So the first Christians, they did a lot of apostolic work and they made the Catholic Church bigger because they were silently going through society, serving as a role model. They would be the very best people in their academic disciplines. They would be the very best people in their profession. They would be absolutely outstanding. And then somebody would tell them how you do this. And you say, how I do this? You know, I believe that I'm achieving sainthood because I have this divine affiliation every day when I do my work. And I'm doing for the greater goal, glory of God. And you know, that's a good topic of conversation that allows people to go to conversion. But you have to do it quietly. And you have to do it literally by becoming the very best of who you are and what you are in, in, in that academic discipline or in your profession. So if you go out without showing that you are the best, then you don't become a role model. So it's first, always work. And while you do your work very silently, so you always have divine filiation, to knowing that you're a child of God, having his presence. But through life, you move very slowly. So you don't ask somebody to marry until you are pretty sure that they're going to say yes. <laughs> I think that's our last question. Yeah. Okay, well, it has been a pleasure. Thank you. Dean Schnell, thank you so much for your thoughtful reflection and for engaging with our students on these important themes. The DeNicola Center community greatly appreciates your contributions to science, to this university, and to the church. At this time, I have a few announcements to share. We, are ex we have some exciting news. The Notre Dame Right to Life Club will be at the 2024 National March for Life, which will take place on Friday, January 19th, in Washington, D.C. Registration will open on November 27th, the Monday immediately after Thanksgiving, which will mark the beginning of our March for Life promotional week. In addition to the march itself, our trip will include attendance at Life Fest 2024, hosted by the Sisters of Life, as well as an opportunity to attend the 25th annual Cardinal O'Connor Conference for Life. Our theme this year is Under Her Mantle, We Fight for Life. We ask for Our Lady's intercession as we fight for the protection of life in all its stages and strive to provide loving support to the women whose babies are in danger of abortion that they may lovingly choose life. Then on April 27th of this spring, the Nicholas Center will be bestowing the 13th annual Notre Dame Evangelium Vitae Medal this award is the nation's most important lifetime achievement award for heroes in the pro-life movement, honoring individuals whose outstanding efforts have served to proclaim the gospel, love, the gospel of life.
by steadfastly affirming and defending the sanctity of human life from its earliest stages. This year's medal will honor Dr. Elvira Paravagini, founder, founding director of the Neonatal Comfort Care Program and professor of pediatrics at Columbia University Medical Center. In a time where so many doctors counsel mothers of unborn children with fatal diagnoses to abort, her extraordinary work has made it possible for these mothers to carry their beloved children to term and spend precious time with these newborns who may only live for a few minutes or hours. This celebration of life includes mass, a reception, and dinner to which Soren Fellows are invited. Please save this date of Saturday, April 27th, 2024. Lastly, we have some copies of Pope St. John Paul II's encyclical, Evangelium Vitae, available for free on one of the tables in the reception area. Its prophetic witness to the centrality of life in the gospel of Christ, its eloquent and charitable affirmation of the church's teachings on sexuality and life, and its message of the goodness of all creation are substantial food for those who are serious about life issues. Please pick up a copy on your way out if you'd like one. At this time, before giving the podium back to Laura for some final remarks, I'd like to offer the stage to Father Terry for some final words. So this is mostly just an announcement that those who have liked this event would probably like the event that's coming up on Wednesday, which is also a science and faith related theme, which is the Notre Dame Gold Mass and Lecture. It started in 2017 here, and this year there's a gold mat. Gold is the color for scientists, their, their tassels and their robes that they wear. And so it's for scientists and engineers, mass at 515 in the Basilica, presided and preached at by yours truly, then a savory reception in the Jordan Galleria, and then we have a, the gold mass lecturer by a Catholic embryologist at the University of Utah, Maureen Conduct, who's going to speak on identical twinning untangled how science resolves the question of the beginning of life. And you probably want to just come to hear Dean Schnell introduce her. So he'll be there as well. So, so please, if you've got, if you got time on Wednesday, 515 Basilica, 715 is the, is the talk in Jordan. Thanks, Father Terry. And thank you, Dean Schnell, uh, for being with, us this, being with us this evening and for all that you do for Our Ladies University for our students, for the DeNicola Center, and especially for our Soren Fellows. Thank you also to all the faculty and staff who have joined us here tonight. What a great gift you are to the Notre Dame community and, again, to our students. Thank you also to Soren Fellows Lauren Douglas and Peter Nagy for planning this event and serving as student co-chairs, and to Phil Tran, DeNicola Center Program Coordinator, and executing the event as well. And lastly, thank you to you all, our Soren Fellows and beloved students. Um, I know if Professor Sneed were here tonight, he would remind you all to take care of yourselves and take care of each other, especially during this time of year. Know of our prayers for a, fr for a fruitful remainder of the year. God bless.